I'm Jennifer Katzenstein. It's a small group, so let's, um, I'll get through this part of the talk, and then I'm going to be happy to answer any questions. We are recording, and so it provides us a nice opportunity to provide those questions and answers to people as well. Um, so as Mindy so nicely introduced me, I'm a psychologist and neuropsychologist at Johns Hopkins All Children's, um, and we're going to be talking today about helping your child with learning or organizational challenges following transplant. Um, our objectives look really long here, and I'll be honest, they're shorter than when we started planning for this, and so really my goal is to be able to talk to you about what to expect, what you might be seeing in terms of neurocognitive challenges, but then also talking about setting up educational services and setting up home interventions and school interventions for success. And so there's also some slides towards the end with some resources as well. So when we talk about post-transplant neurocognitive functioning, it's really complicated by other types of treatment that the child may have received. And so what we know from the research is that we're looking at difficulties with inattention, difficulties with executive functioning, so that means planning and organization, multitasking, shifting, keeping our bedroom clean, keeping our backpack organized, um, and also processing speed, which we'll talk through each of those things and also different types of evaluations and how we look at those cognitive skills. Girls are typically more at risk than boys. Um, we used to think that younger age at treatment was a protective factor, and it turns out as we were able to follow those kids longer term, we found that younger age of treatment actually becomes a risk factor because we're impacting the developing brain. And so then at that point, the brain is reorganizing um, with the goal of being able to utilize areas of the brain for essential level skills, which typically are language-based. And also pre-transplant um, functioning is a predictor of later transplant success in terms of cognitive functioning as well. So if you were higher level functioning prior to transplant, we see that you had more cognitive reserve and that serves you well post-transplant. So when we talk about late effects of treatment, when we're talking about inattention, executive functioning, processing speed, all of those cognitive skills play into things like learning and memory. And so if we aren't able to maintain attention if we aren't able to quickly and efficiently process new information, if a child has more difficulty organizing the new learning that they're engaging in, then that won't go to long-term memory storage. And so while a lot of times parents talk to me about specific difficulties with memory, it's less frequent that it's an actual memory problem and more frequent that it's some aspect of neurocognitive functioning that plays into the initial learning processes. We'll talk a little bit about that. And similarly, as we think about a child growing over time, especially as we get to the late middle school and early high school years, we have greater and greater demand on executive functioning skills. More planning and organization, more independence in that learning. And that's also when our frontal lobe, the front part of our brain, is doing the most amount of development and continues to develop until age 25. So when you hear about someone saying we're growing into deficits, it means that we're growing into the time when we expect those cognitive functions to come online, and maybe now the brain can't support that as well as it would have been able to because that frontal lobe is continuing to develop. But there are some things we can do to support that. Um, that's why as a neuropsychologist, my goal is baseline as close as we can to time of initial diagnosis pre-treatment to establish where we're at cognitively, and then annual evaluations to see how well our cognitive functions are coming online if there is decline, we want to track that decline until it evens out, so we know that maybe we've reached the point that it's going to be at. And at the very least, there's different time points in terms of educational trajectory that we want to assess as well. Big time points for me are third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and between 10th and 11th grade. Third, fifth, and eighth are times when we have pretty big transitions in terms of what kids are expected to do in the classroom. But then that 10th to 11th grade point is when we start thinking about SAT, ACT, and college or post high school settings. And you're going to need a recent evaluation, as in within three years, in order to get accommodations on things like ACT and SAT, but also for accommodations that we can carry over from high school to the college setting as well. And I'm always happy to assess and talk about that as well. So there's two different types of evaluations, and even a third type we'll talk about as well that you may come across when you're talking to your provider. Um, as a neuropsychologist, I'm doing a neuropsychological evaluation almost always for a child who has a medical condition that would impact brain functioning or who's undergone transplant, they're going to qualify for medical necessity in order to get a neuropsych eval. 
if you're going through your public school system or if you're in a private school and the private school is having the public school do the testing, you're going to get a psychoeducational evaluation. That's going to be much more limited in scope. That may be just looking at IQ, maybe, maybe looking at academic skills. They can formally test them the way that we do in the schools, or sometimes schools rely upon grades and standardized testing in order to make those evaluations. And then sometimes they're including parent and teacher report. And the schools, if you're in a public school setting, they're required to reevaluate every three years. And reevaluate means they can reevaluate the need for further evaluation. My hope for all of my families is that they're already tied in with a provider outside of the schools so that we're doing those evaluations anyway so that we can hand them over to the school, work collaboratively with the school. If they say, oh no, we want this test or that test, then a provider should be able to do that to help accommodate school even more so for you so that you're not worrying about the school calendar, the school following through, because sometimes we can have some barriers and challenges there. So from a neuropsych perspective, I'm really wanting to know how is this brain functioning? How does this child think? How do they problem solve? Was there an area of the brain specifically that was impacted from treatment? Is this in line with the medical history? Do we have appropriate expectations for this child in the classroom? If we're having more behavior outbursts or more frustration tolerance, maybe we can make some accommodations or modifications to the curriculum so that we can better set them up for success. Are there areas of strengths that we can capitalize on? Um, and what does the future look like? So we can start talking about prognosis and what the future holds. Many, many of my families have children that go on to college. And so it's a matter of let's look at where we're at, let's look at what we can do, and how do we make sure we're at a college that's setting us up for success and putting everything we need to have in place for success. So as we just talked about, when you look at a psychoeducational evaluation at the schools, you're hopefully getting an IQ test, you're hopefully getting measures of academics, hopefully attention span, and usually parent and teacher measures of emotional and behavioral functioning. When we start to, start to talk about a neuropsych, we're doing everything on the left, but we're taking it further because I want to know what that learning profile looks like. And as we talked about in the beginning here, when we're talking about potential deficits in attention, executive functioning, and processing speed, all of those components play into our learning, our ability to then retain that newly learned information in long-term memory, and how well we're also able to recall that previously learned information when we may be experiencing some areas of difficulty on the front end. We're going to look at memory and learning profiles from a visual spatial perspective, an auditory verbal perspective. Sometimes we're doing a um, kinesthetic or hands-on perspective because we want to see where that child's strengths are in terms of their learning. We'll also screen for fine motor deficits or visual motor problem solving deficits. How well can that child take what they see, say on the board um, or from their mind, and get it out through their hands, excuse me. <coughs> We're also looking at visual spatial skills, social pragmatic skills, social interaction, knowledges of appropriate social interactions with others, and language. So executive functioning specifically, um, as I wanted to be able to really go through it with you, um, on the slide, it's a little bit cut off at the top. In the middle, we're looking at the definition of each of the domains on the left, and then on the right, what it might look like if we're having trouble in one of those areas. And these are all components, again, of executive functioning, that frontal lobe development. Initiation could be difficult, so not knowing where to start. Avoiding tasks because they seem overwhelming, and so rather than diving in and starting somewhere, procrastination. That's what I hear a lot when we have initiation difficulties. Inhibition can be a concern, having difficulties putting the brakes on. Um, shifting, having difficulties shifting between tasks. Planning can be difficult, so being able to break down a bigger task like a book report, a project, or a longer term goal or a short term goal into manageable parts, put a timeline to that. We talked a little bit about organization, so organization of our problem solving, um, but you'll see it's also organization of materials. Is this student having difficulty maintaining their backpack, maintaining their assignment notebook, bringing home the right homework or the right textbook? Um, Self-monitoring, knowing throughout the process of learning that they're able to be successful or staying on task or changing a strategy if it's not working. Emotional control, managing our emotions, not having outbursts or explosive behavior. And then working memory. That's our ability to hold short-term information in mind while problem solving. And the example I used to use, because it made more sense, is that we would go to the phone book, look up a phone number, memorize that phone number, and then make it all the way to the phone to be able to dial it. 
um, no longer an issue, right? Because you Google it and you touch the phone number and poof, it's taken care of. Um, but this still is an important task for us to be able to do. We have to be able to take small bits of information and maintain it in our mind while doing some type of problem solving. Not all of that information will transfer to long-term memory, right? We'll have almost just like a little glimpse of it, but we still need to be able to do that for efficient learning. So what we see when kids have difficulties in some aspect of cognitive functioning, and it's important, for me, oh, sorry, it's important for me to note, too, that all of us have strengths and weaknesses in terms of cognitive functioning. And so if we're having an area of difficulty in terms of academics, we aren't feeling success. And sometimes that can lead to anxiety, and it can lead to avoidance of school. Because if we don't have a positive academic self-concept, we may not want to focus our effort on school. It doesn't feel good. Or if we're not being able to feel success, my ability to control how much effort I put in allows me then to maybe avoid work. So I can say, well, I didn't try anyway, so of course I didn't do well, rather than putting in maximal effort and still not doing well and not getting positive feedback. So if we're not effectively using cognitive functions or strategies, we may not be having efficient or positive performance, we're not feeling academic success, our academic self-concept goes down, we may have more signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression, and then our effort goes down as well, which in turn then results in poor grades, and everyone at school and at home yelling at you about your grades. Um, so you can see there's a real emotional and mood component to um, our kids when they're having difficulties with cognitive functioning. So what do we do about it? Really a good place to start is with testing, as we've talked about. Um, but within that, too, obviously school is where the child spends a lot of time and also is learning the majority of information. Um, when I'm working with parents who are doing homeschooling or virtual schooling, um, there's great opportunities as well for us to do those. So if anyone has questions about that, um, this is really focused on public schools and how we can help inform private schools. Okay. Um, when we talk about Florida schools specifically, before we move to an IEP or a 504 plan that we're going to talk about, they're going to start with what's called MTSS, multi-tiered system support. And so that's where we're going to start providing more individualized support in the classroom before we move to the level of a Section 504 plan or an IEP. But if we haven't had success on that MTSS plan, or for a lot of times for our kids who have more medical conditions and more complications, the school is willing to move towards a 504 or an IEP right away. The difference between a 504 and an IEP, a Section 504 plan allows for accommodations to the educational setting and to the curriculum, not a change in the curriculum itself. So we're accommodating how the curriculum is being presented or evaluated. If we move to an IEP, then we're modifying, then we're modifying the curriculum. <laughs> We're modifying how, bless you, how the curriculum is being presented. And so if we're doing that, then we're actually making changes to how we're giving the curriculum to our children or how they're being evaluated. That may mean shortened exam rather than longer time for the exam. It may mean every third homework problem instead of every homework problem. Um, more individualized support, that's what's going to occur via an IEP. So we're looking for some very specific things that are quite basic, and we're gonna talk about some more, but notes in advance with blanks. That's a great place to start. That way we're not relying on processing speed or executive functioning skills. The student is given notes in advance from the teacher. Maybe the teacher has whited out some random parts that have key terms, so they still have to maintain attention, but the onus is taken away to write down every word. They're getting all the major pieces, and then they can fill in those key terms as they're going through. Um, we may want to also explain information verbally, giving information verbally and visual spatial information. So we're relying on multiple different sensory domains to learn new information. When we ask for a student to repeat that back, what we're asking for is for them to repeat it back in their own words, not just exactly what they said, because it's going to, again, demonstrate that understanding exactly preferential seating closer to the teacher, closer to the front of the classroom. Um, and again, those individualized supports we're going to talk a little bit more about next. When we talk about an IEP, we can also get speech language therapy if we need it, especially for our younger kids. Occupational therapy, if we're having any sensory difficulties in the classroom, or we're having difficulties with fine motor control or dexterity. Um, we can get counseling through the schools if needed, especially if there's a bullying component. We want to make sure that the student has a safe person to go to at school. Um, and then outside of IEPs in schools, 
two areas that I'm often working with students on and our patients are psychotherapy, if we have more anxiety or depression that's occurring, or academic coaching. And so what academic coaching is, um, we'll get to a few workbooks for academic coaching, but the goal is to be scaffolding and providing our patients and our children with the skills, very externalized. So perhaps I'm handing over a full plan of how to break down that book report. We're working through it step by step, date by date, and then slowly I'm backing off from that over time. So maybe the first three or four big projects, we're really breaking them down. We're providing reinforcers every time that student has had success with a specific part of the plan. Um, but then we're backing off slowly so that they're internalizing that, internalizing that plan and finding what coping works best for them. When we talk about school-aged um, children, um, we're going to be seeking educational services first and foremost from their child's teacher. So when we're talking about K, kindergarten through about sixth grade, um, we're going to go directly to the teacher, find out about academic weaknesses, behavior problems, attention, focus in the classroom, um, classroom participation, or any current or previous interventions. Because the school isn't necessarily required to let you know if they've started doing the tiered level supports, the multi-tier system. So the school may already be on a track to heading towards an IEP or a 504, and you might not necessarily know about it. So seeing where they're at and if they are providing any individual supports. Um, additional contacts after the teacher. So if you find that you're not getting anywhere with the teacher, where should you be going next? The school counselor. Um, there should be a special education lead within the school. You should be able to ask um, the front office who that is and getting in touch with them. Um, and then going to the principal if necessary. I've still had families, despite going to the teacher and going to special education school lead and going to the principal, not had success. And so that's when we're going to talk about the second half of the slide here. Um, what's important to remember about the public schools is they're required to provide FAPE, a free and appropriate education. That doesn't mean always that it's the optimal or perfect education. So sometimes we're talking with families about that. We have an educational liaison at Johns Hopkins All Children's who is a conduit between us as providers and the family with the school to figure out where we're at, what the school's doing, and making sure the school's following the specific laws. But also, even with those things in place, sometimes we do have schools where we're just not able to work through that either the school is resistant for some reason or the school doesn't have the resources truly to provide what that child needs. Um, that's when we start to contact the area special education specialist. So that's when we take things to the next level. We're moving beyond the school specifically and towards the district. Okay? Um, for many states, including in Florida, there are free advocacy services available. Um, so if you search parent advocate, and you're a school district, you should be able to find grant-funded educational advocates for your state that can help support you as well. Um, and then we move towards special education compliance. So at that point, we're often getting someone external to the school to do a full evaluation and provide recommendations. And if you've moved towards this, then the school has agreed not only to pay for that, but to follow the recommendations of the parent chosen expert to do does the evaluation. So when we haven't had success here, we can move to that next level. And that applies for kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, so again, <coughs> excuse me, um, IDEA requires that all students have that FAPE, free and appropriate education, um, which may mean that the student is in the least restrictive environment. So it may mean that they are moved away from a special education small group resource room setting for the full day, which was what we want, into an inclusion classroom. Um, who maybe has an additional teacher in order to support the student. But if we're going to be doing that, we want to make sure that we are still having success at that next least restrictive level. Oftentimes I have schools who come to me and say, well, this student or this patient is doing so well, this is great news, we're going to move them out of this classroom into the inclusion classroom. Sometimes they're doing so well because they're in the right classroom. And so it is also a matter of talking with the school, developing a plan, Potentially the solution is saying, that's amazing, we're so excited that you feel that way. Can we make some small transitions half day a week, three days a week, to see how well that student is doing in the other classroom before we just make this huge jump that we may not be able to smoothly return back from? 
And so making sure that we're being very thoughtful about setting up the planning, especially when a school says that. It makes me very nervous when a school wants to take away an IEP, take away a 504, or change a classroom setting because a student is doing so well. Because sometimes they're finally doing so well because we've done everything we needed to do. Um, again, when we talk about exceptional student education, that's what it's called in Florida. Um, but every state does vary. The categories vary slightly between states because the federal laws dictate some of the education, but then some of it falls to the state level as well. Um, that IEP is going to include accommodations and modifications, those special education services. Um, and in order to do that, we have to have a classification. Um, these um, IEPs are typically reviewed annually. They are legally required to be reviewed annually. Um, but sometimes I see schools also push them off. So this is a good question families often ask me. Is it better to have our IEP at the beginning of the school year or in the middle of the school year or at the end of the school year? I try to avoid having the IEP meetings at the end of the school year because we don't know what that next school year is going to hold. So really at the end of the school year, all that tells me is that we did great this school year or maybe we had some things we could have done differently but it doesn't matter because we're headed into summer. So unless we're getting extended school year services, um, and we can talk about the specific wording that we need to use in order to get that. I prefer that we have an IEP six to eight weeks into the new school year because that's gonna tell us how well things are going in that new school year and also it's going to be able to set up the remainder of the school year hopefully for success. If you've been set up on a cycle for your IEP where you're at the end of the school year, we can easily adjust that by getting you an evaluation and then you present that evaluation to school, request the IEP meeting at the beginning of the next school year, and that sets up your new date. So we can do some things to make sure that we're getting on that cycle right into the beginning of the school year. Um, we're gonna reevaluate as we talked about every three years. Hopefully you'd already be tied in with a provider to be able to do that more regularly. Um, and then there should be a transition plan. So when we're switching usually from eighth grade to ninth grade, that's when we start including the student in the IEP meetings and start talking about transition planning to the high school level and start thinking about what post high school is going to look like. So depending on the developmental level of the student and what they're able to take in is how much time we talk about having them in the IEP meeting and also getting their input before we have them kind of go back to class and continue on with the educational planning. Um, but really by 10th, 11th, 12th grade, it's great to have the student involved and to have them start to realize where our strengths are, where our challenges might be and how we need to move forward when we head to our next um, planned post high school experience. The Section 504 plan is going to be something that's going to be um, uh, the, the accommodations only. Sometimes I call it like an IEP light, and that's not to take away from what it is, but it's to provide those accommodations, and oftentimes we don't need the more intensive modifications or services you get through an IEP. This is, again, reviewed annually, but depends on the state. The child must have a disability, which can include a learning disorder or an attentional disorder um, beyond the medical loan in order to get the... 504. With just the medical, if there's some physical limitations or some ways that the student is limited in how they access the environment, then we can get a 504 as well. But if we're talking about more of a cognitive pattern of strengths and challenges, we're heading towards an IEP because oftentimes the student's going to fall under what's called other health impaired because we have a neurocognitive de deficit that's a result of the medical condition. Um, because that disability must interfere with the child's ability to learn in the general classroom. For the most part, I would say about 90% of my patients have IEPs if they have educational services and about 10% have 504 plans just because the majority of them need more intensive services and the most comprehensive way to get that is through the IEP. Schools may push, I don't know, we can talk about this um, after, if anyone's been asked to move from an IEP down to a 504 plan. Um, again, I wanna be really thoughtful when we do that because we wanna make sure that we're still putting all of the accommodations in place for success. So you, any parent can um, initiate the process. It depends on, by state, how many days the school has from the date you turn in a letter in written form asking for an evaluation for development of educational services. In Florida this past year, we moved from school days to calendar days. So that means they have 30 calendar days, which is great for the students, rather than 30 school days, because school days count actual time we're in school. Um, I want to see you make that formal request. They have 30 days to respond to that request. 
um, usually by asking for your consent to do the evaluation, that's the hope. Um, and then after that, they have 60 days to actually complete the evaluation. Again, in Florida, this switched from school days to calendar days, which puts the time crunch really on our schools to get it done. Again, this is going to consist of a classroom. Um, I'm hoping that they consult with healthcare professionals, so your physicians, your providers, so they can get a good idea of what the medical needs are, if we need to have a health plan as part of that, um, if we're easily fatigued, if we need more water throughout the day, opportunity for breaks or for any um, times where we may need some downtime in the nurse's office, um, and providing the psychoeducational or neuropsychological evaluation so that we have all of that data to give the school to. There's no reason to have some retesting on the same measure done because we already did it. They're standardized measures, they should have the same result. Then we're going to have a school meeting to identify if the student meets eligibility, and then if they qualify, the meetings will be had, held annually. Once the IEP is signed by the parent and the school, that's when it becomes binding. So we can make adjustments to that, and there is some differences by state in who you talk to about whether or not the IEP is binding at the time of the meeting. So sometimes schools and parents will tell me they've been forced to sign the IEP right at that meeting, even though they wanted me to review it because the school is saying, we can't do this until you sign it. It's not actually true, and so don't ever feel pushed into signing an IEP right at that time. You always have the opportunity to take it home, think about it, read through it, and return it signed. Or if an educational liaison or your provider wasn't able to attend via phone, I like to review my patient's IEPs before they're signed so I can write a letter of response. So if there's something missing, I can write a letter asking for a little bit more. So what are we looking at? When we look at an IEP, we're gonna have all the educational status and all the cognitive functioning, and then the description of how that cognitive functioning or the disability is impacting the child's involvement and progress in school. We're gonna have measurable annual goals, and we want these to be attainable and we're gonna have specific tactics on how we're going to meet these goals. So for some students, it's reading, writing, mathematics specific, depending on where the areas of challenge are. For some, it might be executive functioning specific. We're going to work on organizational skills. We're going to work on note taking. We're gonna work on study skills. We may also be including an instructional setting or a placement that is more individualized or small group instruction, so that could be something like a resource room. Um, and then any related services will be listed as well, speech, OT, PT, some schools, especially as you get to the high school level, do have additional or supplemental supports for studying and organization skills, so they might be able to enroll your student in one of those classes. If we're, and I'm gonna make a quick switch, this is a good time to ask questions, um, but we'll hold off, because I think those are the rules to the end. Yeah. Okay, does anyone have any IEP 504 questions specifically about the process? Go, that's perfect. So I'm right in the middle of it right now. Oh, perfect. I've, had, uh, I've got a 12-year-old who's been out um, most all of fifth grade. Okay. So he's missed all of fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And so who I'm dealing with is the hospital homebound team, mm -hmm. kind of, sort of, which changes it a little bit. Yeah. Um, Prior to fifth grade, he mm -hmm. had a 504. Okay. He had had an initial diagnosis in second grade, Okay. was out for half of the year, came back, mm -hmm. third and fourth grade, doing well, doing well, and okay. then relapsed in the summer between okay. fourth and fifth grade. So now we're dealing with our second go around, but missing right. the whole fifth grade year. Gotcha. We had just met and done a two-year assessment post for post chemo for mm -hmm. okay. the first round, kind of mid fourth grade, late fourth grade. Mm -hmm. I saw things were starting to get funky. Yeah. And so we looked at it then. And at that point we were starting to see some executive function was starting mm -hmm. to, to show up. Yeah. So I never had an opportunity to present those results back to the school gotcha. because it happened in the summer right before he was diagnosed or relapsed. Yeah. So now, I'm, they're, they're saying basically, so we had the last academic testing or the last batch of testing done a year ago. Okay. He's been through 
a lot of treatment mm -hmm. since then. Yeah. Uh, additional cancer treatment and the prep for the bone marrow transplant. Yeah. And they're, they were saying, no, I'm getting pushback on starting sixth grade with an IEP. Oh. That where he's at right now mm -hmm. is let's just wait, mm -hmm. is what they said, let's wait for mm -hmm. academic testing and let's see what happens next year. Now I've got the good fortune I've met the, the ESC people at the middle school he'll Good. be attending because he's already been retained yeah. once before we're pushing him through yep. so do you that kind of I was surprised at that kind of pushback mm -hmm. that they yeah. didn't want to like jump into it he just had it done but we've got a whole nother mm -hmm. I'm but you kind of answered part of it is it's better to wait maybe till the beginning of the school year yeah so do you get that a lot where you see that fight, not fight, but that pushback of going from the 504 to the IEP mm -hmm. and academic testing versus what we did with our psychologist a year ago? Right. Are those two separate things? So this, you're as the fight for the 504 to the mm -hmm. IEP. You are hitting on so many things, and I'm remiss. Oh, I'm, for, sorry, I'm so good. Me. For no, it's perfect for me not talking about hospital homebound because you threw another wrench in that yeah. with the hospital homebound. Right. Um, so two pieces. The first and easiest one for me to address as a psychologist, as a neuropsychologist, the school does not have to accept my testing. Incredibly frustrating. But not every school will accept it. Many will and do so. But even if you had had testing even recently that was academic, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be frustrated but not surprised that they were pushing back on accepting that testing because they are not required by law to accept my testing. When you do the whole shebang, academic is in there. Is in there. But they don't have to accept it. So sometimes I'm like, are you kidding me? You have a long wait. Uh, you're using up resources. I did it for you. I, I put a gold bow on it. Here you go. And they still don't care. So that's one component. The second component is the hospital homebound piece. Because certainly my experience with hospital homebound has been it has not met what I would want the curriculum to look like, the individual education to look like. And sometimes I think schools know that. And so they're waiting to see where you're at before we rush in because theoretically, Hospital Homebound should have kept us moving along with the curriculum. But in, re in reality, um, and as it's being recorded, it's gonna, someone will take me to task for this, but in reality it doesn't. How could it possibly? It can't. And so, no, I'm so glad you brought that up and that's the perfect time to bring that up because Hospital Homebound throws an additional wrench in it. And I hear you say we've already been retained. I wanna be very thoughtful. We absolutely need an IEP. I want to be very thoughtful about what that IEP looks like. And my educational liaison would be, I can hear her screaming at me in my head right now, saying, you're setting the school up for failure. But we haven't met curriculum-wise what he likely needed before, over the time of hospital homebound. And so now if we head right into sixth grade with that 504, we're going to have a lot of struggle. Yeah, are you in Florida? I'm in Tampa. Oh, you are? I'm oh. so close. I'm going to give you my email. No, this is perfect. So you, then my, my educational liaison is going to yell at you, me, and it's going to be perfect because we're going to, yeah. That's awesome. 100%. Because you won't be ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's my struggle because hospital homebound in its nature, right, this is amazing. We're getting a teacher to come to the house. Sometimes I've got students, and the ideal is we're being Skyped into math every day, right? But so rarely is it meeting the whole curriculum. Mm -hmm. Huge butt. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That four hours is great. I've got kids on one hour a week. I mean, just how would you possibly be able? To, it's crazy, right? So, no, it's a perfect. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're in Tampa. Okay. Good. So, if you have a student um, who has behavior difficulties in the classroom, that's when we move towards a functional behavior analysis. So this is what's going to set up our behavior intervention plan. So hospital homebound, I apologize, I'm remiss for not talking about that. <coughs> but the FBA is something that is incredibly important when there's a dysfunctional behavior in the classroom, a behavior that's interfering with learning. Because the FBA will identify the triggers for that behavior, 
the consequences. It will establish interventions um, in order to change the target behavior and inform the Positive Behavior Intervention Plan, the PBIP, in order to make sure that we are addressing behaviors appropriately in the classroom. This should include a behavior specialist who may be the school psychologist or it may be someone else. So that could include something like a behavior chart, um, some consequences. Oftentimes we're looking at very positive reinforcers. If we're having difficulties with attention, sometimes an FBA is appropriate if we're trying to redirect or keep that student on task. Um, but what I've provided here are what some of my very common recommendations are in terms of attention weaknesses. Thank you. So giving permission to be close to the classroom teacher, um, redirecting as needed. I really like to have a nonverbal cue for when the teacher recognizes the student isn't paying attention. It's not a calling out and saying, you know, Theodore, you're not paying attention. It's just a walk by and a tap on the desk. Something very simple that isn't calling that student out in front of the rest of the class. We want to use those nonverbal cues, establish eye contact, ask for re repetition, um, use few words to explain a task. Um, when we do testing, sometimes I can say to families, your max is five, seven, nine words when you're giving an instruction. Beyond that, th no one's listening to you. So keep those instructions to that number of words, um, requiring, again, that restatement or repetition of information. For executive functioning, this is a big, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, um, being proactive about note taking, breaking large tasks down into small tasks. When you even think about something such as cleaning your room, that can be overwhelming for a child with executive functioning deficits. What does that even mean? Go upstairs and clean your room. Especially if your room's a disaster. So breaking it down. Go upstairs, I need you to put all of the dirty clothes in the hamper, then come back in and check it with me. That gives you an opportunity for praise. You're amazing, you did that already. Why don't you run back upstairs, put all of your books on your bookshelf, or put all of your toys one step at a time back into this container. Come back down and check in with me. As parents, right, we're so used to balancing multiple things that it just comes naturally, but oftentimes for our kids, it's much harder for them, and even for typical development of executive functioning. I joke that car rental companies are the only ones that got it right. We continue to develop, right, our frontal lobe until age 25. So things that come naturally for us aren't coming naturally for our teenagers. So starting to think about more opportunity for praise, one step directions at a time. How do I take a big overwhelming task and really break it down? Um, and then helping your child use assignment notebooks, checking them every day, having someone at school check every day to make sure that the right worksheet, the right textbook is already included. Um, here are some of my favorite books. Um, they're actually listed in my favorite order, even. Um, so <laughs> these are great opportunities for looking um, at executive functioning skills. And the ones by Dawson and Guare almost have, do you guys remember, like your choose your own adventure books? Um, you take a quiz in the beginning, and it directs you to the right chapter. So you can even identify right up front where our challenges are from a quiz the parent takes, a quiz that the child takes, and then just flip right to that chapter so you're already working in the chapter where you're going to hopefully be able to focus in on your greatest area of need. Assistive technology is something we haven't talked about yet, but something that I love. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, unfortunately. I have no <laughs> financial gain from any of these things. Um, but donjohnston.com is an amazing website. They have amazing software. Draft Builder is incredible because it takes the essay that that student is writing, they outline keywords, they outline their thesis, they outline their supporting details, and it propagates the essay. So it's taken away a lot of that organizational need by really nicely breaking it down and putting it into an essay format where then the student can go in and fill in the blanks. So again, breaking down one of those barriers for executive functioning. Co-writer and inspiration are nice, the word prediction software, so that we're doing more dictation. And then a smart pen. Has anyone heard of a smart pen before? This is wild. You, um, they have them, there's also multiple options now, there weren't as many options a few years ago. You can take notes on the paper, the pen is recording the lecture, and remembers where you took the note on the page. So that when you go back to study later, you put the pen down on the page, it cues up that part of the lecture. So if we missed a note, if we would like to have some more reinforcement listening to the lecture again, you've got that right there on the pen. So a really nice way to study and be reminded. I know, I wish I had this when I was in college, right? <laughs> um, 
And then um, things, these are for younger kids typically. Um, having a bumpy seat if we're distracted. Um, weighted vests can sometimes be helpful if we're a sensory seeker. Um, fidgets. Fidgets don't have to be fidget spinners. Um, I realize a lot of schools have outlined fidget spinners. Even just putting Velcro taped underneath the desk, something to feel. Um, in the Target dollar aisle, the stretchy little animal favors. You know, something that you can be messing with in your hands if that helps you maintain attention better. Um, I also like to put these little electric, uh, I'm sorry, these elastic bands, or not electric, um, around the chair because then you can slip your feet, kids can slip their feet in them and they can be kicking, but they're getting the sensory feedback of having something come back across their feet if we have some little extra energy. Using a calculator for math, using a special pencil grip if we're having a hard time gripping the pencil, our strength in our hands isn't as good, um, or use of a keyboard or dictation software when we're having difficulty taking notes. If you are having trouble with the school, um, I, I have my card, I'll give you my email address today. Don't hesitate to reach out to me and we can help navigate that. Um, the Complete IEP Guide by Siegel is a fantastic book. It walks you through the special education law um, and gives you parenting tips. I don't have this on here because my educational liaison just told it to me. It is called, a book that she recommends called From Emotions to Advocacy. And so it's a really nice way, is that, yeah to take away the emotions out of it and move towards advocating for your child. Um, there's some other great books. NASP um, has a great publication online. I want to come back to that. And then RTI really breaks down for you what in Florida we call MTSS, breaking down the tiered systems. Um, one of the things on NASP, if we are talking about retention, um, NASP has a policy statement on retention. And it says that retaining a child in grade purely for repetition of the information is not recommended. We only retain in grade when we make an actual accommodation modification to the curriculum. So if we are heading down a retention path, they have some great policy statements that you can bring to your psychologist and say, or your school psychologist, and say, this is what your professional organization is saying about this. So oftentimes I am directing parents to do that as well. Um, so thank you so much. I'm so happy to answer any questions at all. Um, give my contact information, whatever you need. Thank you, Dr. Katz. No Steve, does anyone have any other questions they want to ask right now? Yeah. No. Extended school year, thank you for reminding me. Okay, so extended school year. In order to advocate for extended school year, what you have to demonstrate is that to school, to the school, we have to demonstrate to the school that your student will regress in skills over that period of time. So often we do have to be data driven in that. So if there is the assumption that an extended period of time without school will result in loss of skills, and we often, again, we need data to support that, that's how we get extended school year services. Is that available? I don't think it is. So I think the better course of action is to get a tight relationship with your provider so that you can come in, get some testing, and then we can show through testing regression over the course of the summer or extended school breaks because that's really the take home. That's the hard part, right? We're right there and we've got one foot in the school homebound yet. We're actually waiting for function tests to come back to see if we can even go back to school. It's hard time for a few weeks. Yeah. Has hospital homebound for you supplemented with Florida Virtual? No. Okay. No. And I don't know if that's because it's elementary. There's still opportunities, though. Let's, we're going to talk offline a little bit about that because um, I'll give you my direct line and my email today because that is going to be where I think our next step is. I want my educational liaison involved so that we have an extra check and balance in there, too. Yeah. Sure. So I'm here in a dual role. I am a nurse practitioner in the BMT clinic, so I want information that I can share with my patients and families. Right. But I'm also here as a mom. My daughter was adopted internationally, and she has neuropsych evaluation that shows deficits. She's okay. now in a small private school directed towards children with learning challenges. Mm -hmm. She's a 10th grader. Okay. Her executive functioning is next to zero. I didn't know this, Gretchen. And I worry about her after high school. Mm -hmm. What kind of things do I need to be thinking about to prepare her for after high school? Yeah. Gosh, why haven't we 
Hi. Why haven't we talked before? We can meet for lunch. Maybe. We should. Yeah, I think we need to meet for lunch. I so interestingly, international adoption poses its own set of challenges, um, and depending on where we're adopted from. So th that aside, um, pre-adoption care, time and adoption, um, length of time of development of English language when placed in the United States are all predictors of later success. Um, in terms of thinking about tenth grade, we want a good idea of what's realistic for that student. Um, so f I. <laughs> So many times here, I'm hearing my patients in 10th, 11th grade say, well, I want to go to college and be a video game developer. That is the biggest one right now, right? Yeah. So is that realistic? Probably not. Yes? yes? Yeah? Yes. So that, yeah. That's my, <laughs> you're my special, yeah, my special case. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're not even really enjoying video games. It's just something that we go to. So the first thing is finding out the student, what do you want to do next? What are you capable of doing next? Where are independent living skills at? What are we getting from school? And then how are we going to make that transition to the right university? Um, college, it's on my desk, I'm so sorry. There's a website, and anyone can follow up with me, and I'll provide it, um, that provides academic services for multiple universities. I want to say it's like collegesupports.net or something that have additional accommodation and modification supports with, built within their curriculum already so that you can be thinking proactively about the right college or university setting to then set that up for success. She's interested in like criminal justice or oh, a police officer okay. or like the SBU. She wants to be a psychoanalyst to help oh. behavioral assessments mm -hmm. of these criminals. And it's like, I'm not quite so sure. Right. Well, and I think it's, we have the opportunity, especially when we can capitalize on, especially a, a private school setting that's thinking about that, talking through some career counseling, doing some of those career inventories online to see where we line up. And so, I, you know, I love where your head is at in terms of wanting to do criminal investigation. What's something that could be similar to that? You know, and then that provides us more of a pivot to think about a broader range of activities. Yeah. We, we need to go to lunch. Yeah. So I just made a, a few list of things that I'm just um, curious yeah. about. So what if I personally don't feel like the placement my son is in currently right now is mm -hmm. the appropriate place for him, but yet everybody is saying it is? It, <laughs> this is, is it successful? Are we having success? No. Okay. So where do you live? in Boston, Massachusetts, okay. which we have a no child left behind, right. and we also do the neuropsych evaluation every three years. You, you which Boston we, Children's? Yes. Okay, good. Um, which is great. We have an good. advocate. Good. Um, he's currently in language base. <sighs> okay. So he's set up for mm -hmm. everything under the sun. But he's got just, the extended year, the whole yeah. nine, but You're his amazing. motivation, his fatigue, mm -hmm. his his disabilities are spiraling to this point because he's also in the seventh grade. So he's got grade. teenagers coming on and mm -hmm. then this fatigue is in and he sees he's different. Yep. The workload is just so much for him. Mm -hmm. He's completely, he used to hit a wall in mm -hmm. spring. 30 days into the school year, he hit a complete wall. I had to leave work and just oh get him gosh. out the door every morning. Yeah. So this whole year, mm -hmm. not one book came home with him, not one piece of paper. He just refused, he shut down. Mm -hmm. And like, to force him to do this stuff, I didn't know if it was gonna be going another way or, right. so how do I re-engage him, mm -hmm. get him placed, yep. figure out, like what's the next step when everybody says, we have him set up, but he's not doing what he's, he's supposed to. And, and I'm, we're not gonna get That's anywhere. When, okay, so three things. I want your advocate and your provider on the phone for the next meeting. Because they need to be saying, because it sounds like we're already in the failing, right? A lot of times we need to fail um, in order to get more services, right? That's what demonstrates educational need. And I met with each of them individually, but we'll get them together. I need all of them together in the same room. Okay. Um, and I want the outcome walking away from that meeting to be regular check-ins. So yeah. we're going to keep following up. We're going to make modifications to this curriculum now because now we're shut down. So recovery from this shutdown, especially heading into summer, can be incredibly difficult. We're getting everyone in the room. We're reconvening for IEP meetings. We're going to be doing it at regular intervals um, because this is the super hard part for my families. Mm -hmm. You back off, mm -hmm. right? And we lose everything. Everything, I feel like. Because you're doing it. it all, right? You're supporting him. You're getting him out the door. You're trying to keep track I quit of homework. Work. You quit work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so we got to get everyone back in the room. That may mean also having a therapist on the outside, too. 
Right. So we need to show school that we're doing everything we possibly can on our end and we're having significant impact. The only thing is, it's like Michaela is not a behavioral kid. He's, he's very like kind and like will do anything anybody asks. Yep. He just, well, you just have to ask him. It's flying under the he radar. He won't do anything. And so to get him to do like, to pull his weight, mm -hmm. then it tur could turn behavioral. Yeah. Because then he's like, we'll get alone. And he's like, I don't want to do this, you know, and it's like, I'm just worried about pushing too many buttons, mm -hmm. but yet I don't want to lose them either. Well, it's the academic success cycle, right? We're not feeling success. We're getting more frustrated. We're having this shutdown. So we got to get everyone in the same room, and we need to back off. School has to back off because we need to reintegrate back into school success with small, achievable feelings of positive academic experience. How do I deal with the fact that every year it's reinventing the wheel? That is That for the last three years has been mm -hmm. the most difficult challenge for me because yep. I'm like, now I'm going back in to re 30 days, I let the teachers figure them out. Right. But then I'm back in the end, in you know, October saying, mm -hmm. okay, what have you figured out about Michaela? And they really don't know them. They can't figure them out. And uh, this question comes up so often, and I don't have a good answer. Yeah. It is continuing to advocate the way that you are, continuing to go back in. The, um, I have a mom that I love this. She makes stickers with her child's face on them. Um, and puts them on muffins and bagels and said, this is all for my son, and brings it everywhere that she goes with the teachers, with the schools, to number one, recenter the meeting, to remember it's about the student and yes. not about any adversity, but also to sweeten them up. And yes. I love it. Yes. Because it's that. It's going to be your, every year coming in with yep. your basket of goodies, yep. with a picture and a letter and a reminder of what this, and sometimes it's purely, he has an IEP. The hardest part is like, amongst professionals and adults like I win them over all the time they right. will eat out of my hand if I ask them to do something they'll do it for Michaela mm -hmm. it's just when they're there alone um, and he yep. has to produce and they're not seeing him produce they yeah. just let him not do anything at all right and that's where we got to say to them we have to continue to push I need you not to just let it go when you find a good teacher when you find a good teacher's assistant trying to advocate for that person to follow every year because that's, I mean, we're going to be able to make baby steps in that way. I, I'm so I don't have a good solution for yeah. the long term. That is hard because I've got that child too that will, because they are compliant, mm -hmm. they're not rude, right? In a great manner, yeah, right. And they, are, they fly under the radar and they're not causing problems. Mm -hmm. That when you're not this, okay. yeah, you, you the squeaky wheel, yeah. They're, they're okay. They're mm -hmm. Yeah. Is maybe holding the teachers accountable for a monthly checklist. Mm -hmm. I need a monthly list of the assignments that were completed, or of what you required, and then a monthly checklist of what he completed. Maybe they need to see on paper that just because he's behaving well, mm -hmm. he's not succeeding on paper because he only handed in 22% of what they, and that's mm -hmm. not okay. So, to, and to get them to buy in that just because he looks okay doesn't mean he's doing it. Yeah. And I, I want to repeat that back. Um, so there's two components to that. One is getting that monthly checklist so you know what's actually getting turned in, right? But if we can get, I would say, shorter duration, the better. And if we can get teachers to give that to you at the beginning of the week so you know what's due, so it isn't coming to Thursday night when we're procrastinating or rushing so through we things. implemented a daily checklist. Mm -hmm. So every day he comes home with this sheet of paper. Has anyone at school checked it before he left to make sure it's accurate or that he yeah. has? Okay. So first I had suggested like, so you know, his things, eye contact, mm -hmm. like just these little cues, like are you doing X, Y, and Z in the classroom? Right. Because you're lost and yeah. you have no idea what's going on. So if you follow these cues, mm -hmm. then you'll have better success in the classroom. And so they just grade him on, like, did he give eye contact? Did yeah. he do this? And they'll do, like, one, two, three, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. Like, right. it's, it's, it's coming home every day. It's checked it's out. It's checked off. And then I say to him, you know, the memory is probably the hardest thing for him. So mm -hmm. I'll say to him, you know, pull out your homework. The right. other thing is, is he just, just completely doesn't want to do anything at home anymore. So he refuses to, like, leave school until all his work is done, too. Oh, I love that. That's not that's, that's, not, that's great. Well, yeah. The teachers are like, go home. And yeah. he's like, no, 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 I'm not doing this at home. I'm okay. doing it right here. And if so we can get that written in, 
Like if we could get one-on-one -on -one support for him for an hour after school every day, all the better for you, right? I love that. Get it done at school. I want it done with someone who's double checking to make sure he's doing it right so we're not doing it the wrong way. Yeah. Um, and if we need to shorten assignments because we're not getting through it in that order, totally. perfect, then we shorten assignments. But let's write in for that hour extra every day at school where he gets individualized support. Maybe the study hall is the last period of the day or time away from the rest of his class so that he can get through that. Because yeah. otherwise you're, I mean, it, like sometimes in some schools, and I don't know as much about the Massachusetts system, unfortunately, we're fighting an uphill battle every year. And until we get the right combination of teachers and advocates, um, then we get a few years, maybe, but then the second we switch schools again, and sometimes we're starting all over. How, um, how much of it is like appropriate to ask a teacher mm -hmm. to, I mean, they're managing they're, an yep. entire classroom of students, mm -hmm. um, and then our language-based kids and all right. this other stuff. How appropriate is it for me to say, I need this X, Y, Z information, weekly, daily, monthly, like, is it? 100% acceptable. Be? If it's appropriate for this child, I appreciate that they're, I appreciate you being so thoughtful about the school. I want them to get everything that that child needs. Okay. And if that means the school has to hire an assistant, the school has to hire an assistant. Do you have like a recommendation of what I could first initiate and say, just so I can get checks and balances on my end, like so I know that Michaela's following through. Mm -hmm. I don't want a grade to be sent to me online saying he got a 20 out of 100. Right. And that's what's happening. And that's what's Because then you find out about it because you're checking online. And it's done. Right. Nope. And every time I would say under the great place to start is any time this student gets below a 65% on an exam, they have an opportunity to retest with the assistance of a um, teacher's assistant or the teacher prior to that grade becoming final. Great. So we get a retest every time. Because um, then it isn't a 20 that's coming in. There's so many of those things that we can do. That's one of the things I do most frequently is just saying, like, no, 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 no. Like, spelling, I have a student who has a specific learning disability and written expression in spelling. I don't want to see a zero out of 100 anymore. She has learning disability in spelling, right? Anytime it's below a 50%, you haven't done something. So you need to fix that before it gets to my eyes. Yeah. What would be the, um, my last question, what Could would be the last? That's good. <coughs> What could I do? Like, I know we set up goals in our IEP, mm -hmm. and so literally, he's had one since the first grade. I'm still every year learning something new on an IEP because it's every, yeah. gibberish to me. Constant. Um, and, and the laws are changing all the time. So, when we set up these goals, mm -hmm. and I'm obviously included in setting up those goals for him right. as well, how do we, like, in the year, say, who, how many of these goals have been actually achieved mm -hmm. because nobody talks about that. If no one's talking about that, that's a concern. We should be checking in. You should be getting more frequent reports about how the progress we've made towards each of those goals pretty regularly. Like I feel like we just set up new goals every year and then we go through the, the, the year, we do a IEP review mm -hmm. and then make changes if necessary, but we don't really go back and say how much has he completed. We need to be doing that every time. So that's um, unfortunate they're not addressing that. Is that built in somewhere under the IEP? It that should I can be just go to, like the like first third. Yeah, because it should be a, a review of all your evaluations. Okay. And then the next session should be all of your goals. And you should be getting regular feedback just, about those progress. Okay. So yeah. You had mentioned you know, early on the advocate, the non-profit mm -hmm. advocate. Now, I've kind of Googled that here. Mm -hmm. It might be something that would be helpful. It sounds like you have an advocate. I do. Yeah. We do. And, okay. And she's great. Right, oh. But, like now mm -hmm. it's to the point where like I, I can't call it for every little thing. Like right. this is stuff that I need to know because when it comes up it's like it's an email. It's Do you see them. neuropsych at Boston Children's? Yes, and we just had a okay. neuropsych evaluation. Did they did you talk to them at all about who they work with for their advocacy? No, but I can. Let's ask them because oftentimes they're going to be working with someone specifically for their patients. That's what we do. Only our patients. And then that way they're gonna know everything. And they're gonna be more committed because they're tied into the medical side too. Like, that is a big, huge, that's an important piece. The education and the medical side, and that's why so many times year after year you are creating the wheel and so many different wheels because you're educating on the medical. I've had families come back to me and say they think he's faking the fatigue. Yes. Come on, are you kidding me? Yes. Like, yes, like if you... Right, you're, clearly you're keeping him up too late. Like, I can't. I can't, and that's when we say, you know what, I am so excited that you brought that up. As a provider, we have the opportunity to come in, and I'm going to come and give an education to you all on this. 
so that you understand what post radiation looks like, what post chemo. I am so sorry to say yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes for the students, I mean, that's been the beauty of sometimes going into the schools is educating the students too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'll write out my email for both of you today. So I'll give you, I have hundreds of presentations. Yeah. So that you can take them. Yeah. No, I think it's fine. Yeah. And say, this is what I learned today. And this And if you're, talk to your neuropsychologist. And if they aren't able to be on the phone, call me. You know. We just had the feedback meeting. Okay. Okay. They were kind of like a little it. delayed on getting mm-hmm. that report chart. So I don't have everything on paper. I'm curious just to see like if she feels based on the three year ago neuropsych eval to this one, she said no progress. Academically. Yes. That's huge. That, I mean, that right there is your documentation. Well, in a sensitive period for that social interaction and for the overall cognitive development for interactional play. So let's chat about that because this is. That documentation is going to be huge. Oh, I'll be offline now. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll call it off. Thank you.